Amen. Today, again, we come to the end of this church year, the lectionary C year, and with it, the end of ordinary time for a while. Last time I get to wear the green. So today I want to share with you about an aspect of the Lord Jesus Christ that Luke focuses on in this text. For truly, Jesus Christ is King, the King of the law. Luke 19, verse 10, our Lord tells us, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the law. Bow your heads with me, please. Lord God, bless your word wherever it is proclaimed. Make it a word of power and peace to convert those not yet your own and to confirm those who have come to save in faith. May your word pass from the ear to the heart, from the heart to the lip, and from the lip to the life, so that as you have promised, your word may achieve the purpose for which you send it. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so, here we are, another year complete. I find it interesting that unlike cycle C, cycles A and B, along with the gospel reading for the one-year lectionary, take the second coming and the judgment seat of Christ as the subject for the last gospel reading of the church here. Sigurd Grindheim, author of the book Introducing Biblical Theology, wrote the following about the unique elements of Luke's gospel in relation to Christ's death. In his story about Jesus' crucifixion, Luke tells us that the people and the rulers were watching and said, he saved others, let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. There's a deep irony in those words. The mockers were unaware of the profound truth they were expressing, but the audience of Luke's gospel can understand Jesus could not save himself, and the reason was precisely that he had saved others. The climactic moment of Christ's mission, the missio day, is not the second coming. Historic Christian faith confesses that Christ reconciled us to the Father through his death. Romans 5, beginning at verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? In our fear and hatred of death, and because of the pain that is associated with death, we avert our eyes from it. We prefer to look at Easter Sunday with its bright and victorious declaration, he is risen, he is risen indeed, hallelujah. But the resurrection only has value because of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of God's beloved son, Jesus Christ. Now this text is intensely focused on Jesus. In other readings this year, we saw Jesus and those with whom he was engaged whether it was a person needing to be healed or delivered from demonic possession or people whom he was teaching or people who were opposing him. But this text truly centers our focus on Christ, the crucified one. The other participants changed from the crowds who were mourning his suffering to the soldiers and rulers who mockingly derided his status as the Messiah. And finally, the two evildoers who were crucified with him. Beginning at verse 27, a large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Men, they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, to the hills, cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? The first group sympathized with Jesus, but had no understanding 
that his suffering was neither a travesty of justice nor a tragedy. They only understood the situation with their fleshly minds. And as a result, they wept for him, not seeing the fulfillment of the word of God. There are those today who admire the church and mourn the way society scorns the ministry of the church, but they have no insight in the spirit that this too is in the will of God, declared by the spirit for our comfort. Luke continues, the people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was a written notice above him, which read, this is the king of the Jews. The second group deals with Jesus' claims either by passivity or by mocking dismissal. Today's counterpart desires the marginalization of the church so that their worldly lust will no longer be exposed as sins against the king of glory. Neither of those groups share in Christ's affliction. They want no part in them. For them, he is either entertainment or a cautionary tale. And so today, there are those who want no part in the church's travail as she mourns for this world, as she intercedes for this world, as she serves this world. They stand on the sidelines, critique and criticize, but they don't want to share in the marks of Christ. They don't want to share in the mission of God. They don't want to join with the saints, the bride of Christ, who joyfully joins her Lord in his suffering, that she may partake in his glory. But it's different with the two criminals. They are with him on God. They suffer with him. And they share something else. Verse 39. One of the criminals who hung there throws insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Two sentences. The first a question. The other a demand. The first sentence introduces an interesting idea. Believe it or not. The expected answer to his question, aren't you the, the Messiah, is yes, not no. On some level, this criminal, this insurrectionist, perhaps, because Rome only called you an evil worker when you set yourself against Rome. They didn't care about petty thieves. They cared about insurrection. Yeah. But this criminal, this evil seer, has verbalized the truth that Jesus is the Messiah. His problem lies in the second sentence. In effect, he says, you are the Messiah, aren't you? You're the guy that, that, that I've been working to undermine Romans' authority. I've been trying to terrorize the Roman government. I've been trying to Encourage the people of Judea to rise up against this oppressor. You're the king that I've been working for. Well, save yourself and us. Vindicate our struggle. Use your power, Jesus, to get us out of this place. And there are those who are part of the church militant, the church on earth, who recognize the authority of God and the lordship of Christ, but expect and even demand that God uses his power to make their earthly lives comfortable. Their prayer is not, let your kingdom come, but let my kingdom come. Verse 40, but the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The second does not call Jesus the Christ. He acknowledges him as king. He recognizes that he himself deserves what is happening to him, that he is indeed a poor 
miserable sinner against the laws of men, but also against the law of God. He then speaks to the one who is able to keep him from falling. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. No, it's not a question. He does not state those words as a wish or as a hope. It's actually an imperative, a command. The lesser commands the greater. Remember me. And if the roles were reversed, if it were Jesus saying to him those words, it would be a command. He would be obligated to obey or be exposed as a transgressor. But it comes from the Lord to the higher. And yet, such is his confidence in who Jesus is, that he calls him by name, that he acknowledges who he is, not just what he is. And he says to him, do this. He shared in Christ's sufferings and rejoiced in the fulfillment of the Missio Dei. He put his trust in the Savior, not to just to spend it on earth, but to fulfill his purpose. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. I find it interesting, Jesus said nothing. Mercy. Perhaps it was in his mercy he let those words pass. Perhaps, just as God is merciful to us, sometimes we say things that in retrospect we wish we hadn't said to the Lord. Sometimes we pray prayers that you know we'd like to rewind. Sometimes we make old promises, statements that on retrospect, before further review, as they say on Sunday. And there are those times that God graciously overlooks those prayers, overlooks those statements, overlooks that outrage, just like he did with Israel in Malachi. He overlooked their claim that God was blessing the arrogant. God does that because he loves us. He loves us not only more than he desires to punish us, he loves us full stop, period. Everything he does, he does in love, even when he inflicts wrath, it's done in love. And so the church proclaims today to those who share in Christ's suffering that they will also share in his glory. The church of Christ echoes Christ's words, enter into the joy of your Lord to all who will hear. All who will believe in the gospel of Christ. This is the message we are called to confess in this world. Not come to Jesus and be at ease in the world. But trust in Christ and be saved at his return. This is the message that we confess to those who are lost. That Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords. His scepter is the scepter of righteousness. And when you rebel against the King of kings, you cannot expect that you will do so without consequence. If the earthly rulers are justified in crushing rebellion, how much more he who rules from heaven? And so now we are identified with him. Having been united to his death by the Holy Spirit through holy baptism, we bear on our bodies the marks of Jesus, as Paul said in Galatians 6.17. But then we will be identified with him as we share in his glorious resurrection. Even now, although we live in this fallen, sinful world, we know that our citizenship lies elsewhere in his kingdom. Colossians 1, verse 13 and 14 says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Our neighbor, to whom we offer service, receives and, and has an opportunity to experience our identity in Christ as we serve them. For we are the body of Christ. We share in his mission of reconciliation and redemption. 
We are the bride of Christ. He has but one. He doesn't have a harem. It is not his desire that we fight with one another any more is it than it is the doctor's desire when our body fights against itself, when our immune system fights against against other organs, when we find ourselves succumbing to a fever to put down a virus. It's not what the doctor would have, but it happens. It happens because we live in a sin-sick world. But it won't always be like that. We have the victory because we have more than conquerors through him who loved us. His message does set people free. It does heal the afflicted. And it does comfort those who are hurting. It is God's message of vindication. This is my beloved son. Hear him. And so, this is our great privilege to carry this treasure in these earthen vessels, in our hearts and minds, on our lips, with our hands. We carry the message of the crucified one, the one who humbled himself on the cross to lift us up from the sin sick world, who emptied himself in order that we might be filled with all the fullness of him who called us, who opened his mouth and revealed the heart of the Father in order that we might know that Christ is for us. And so, as the author of Hebrews closed, now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And amen.